get by It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a beach If you find the same And right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Wise here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And today's guest is no other than David Melter of Sports One Marketing. I'm going to introduce him formally in a second. David, I like to point people to other episodes. Um, And, you know, as you know, with with your story and many other stories, the journey is not always easy and uh, sometimes we hit bumps in the road and we don't see the behind the scenes trials and tribulations. So some of my favorite interviews are just that there was uh, Moise Navone of Mobileye. He talks about when they went on their journey, they were acquired by Intel for $15.3 billion. But what you don't see is all the sacrifices along the way. He had to go back to his family and tell his kids and wife, I'm pulling you out of all extracurricular activities. There's no more eating out because he had to just cut what he was paid. And that's the reality. Um, P90X founder, Tony Horton, most people don't know when he first went cross country to start what he was doing for his career, he made money as a street mime. So he made food and rent money by putting his hat on the street and did street miming. You know, those are the stories I love hearing. And so check out more episodes at inspiredinsider.com. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses connect to and give to their dream 100 relationships. And we do that by helping you run your podcast. You know, David, for you, I think it's the same for me. The number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at a way to give to my best relationships profile and put on a pedestal of the people and the companies I admire and get them more exposure and, you know, shout out to the world what they're doing. So if you have thought about starting a podcast, you should, if you have questions, you know, go to rise25.com and email us anytime. I am excited about today's guest, and we have to give a big shout out to David's daughter. It's her birthday today. What's her name, David, and and what is she doing these days? Yeah, so Mia's 20 today. She was born on Father's Day, which is a blessing in itself, and she's going to be a junior at Indiana University, and as always, I love her, I'm proud of her, and I always have her back. Very cool. So does she say what she wants to do when she uh, grows up, I guess you could say? (laughs) Uh, so I think she's going to be uh, involved in marketing and business. So uh, she interns for me. She's interned at a lot of different places and relationships that I have. But uh, she has an extremely high emotional intelligence just built for marketing and sales. I love it. I've seen her on some of the chains of emails for sure. I went to Wisconsin, so I can totally relate to the Big Ten. And big shout out to your, you know, David, your team's amazing. Um, they're fast. They're quick. They're so nice. Um Jake Fleshner, Blaine Parrish, and Todd Armstrong have all been able to chat with them and communicate via email. They're all amazing, and it's a reflection upon you too. So um, David Meltzer is the co-founder of Sports One Marketing with Hall of Fame quarterback Warren Moon. David formerly served as CEO of the renowned Lee Steinberg Sports Entertainment Agency, if you have heard of it, probably because it was one of the inspirations for the movie Jerry Maguire. And you know, in his early 20s, David quickly rose in the business world and became a millionaire in his 30s, a multimillionaire and a chain of events caused a uh, rapid downward spiral, I guess you could say, that ended in bankruptcy. And he's emerged to even more rewarding heights. And he's an international bestselling author, executive producer of The Elevator Pitch and Bloomberg and Amazon Prime Television series, Two Minute Drill. I'm looking forward to watching and binge watching those episodes. David, he's the host of the Playbook podcast, where he's had guests anywhere from Dan Aykroyd to Ray Lewis and many, many more. And check out his books, Game Time, Decision Making, Connected to Goodness, Compassion, Capitalism. David, thanks for joining me. Wow. Thank you so much, uh, Jeremy. I really appreciate the opportunity to hopefully share some dummy tax so people can accelerate what they're trying to do. I know that's what Rise25 does is shares that experience, situation, knowledge, and the number one thing stopping us from doing what we want to do is really radical humility, the ability to find someone that's in the position we want to be in and ask them for directions. It's uh, such an obvious thing, but for some reason, we just don't feel comfortable or worthy of asking for help. I want to get into, there's so much great content that you put out, and I encourage people to check out your website. Um, they can go to dmelter.com. Um, and I want to get into the five daily practices a little bit, but 
I need to start with the most important thing. The most important thing is you have just an amazing background. You grew up, I think, one of six kids raised by a single mom. And I would love to start off with some of the lessons that you learned from your mom. Yeah, well, you know, some of the lessons I've, I've learned. Number one, if you think education is expensive, try ignorance. <laughs> I, love, I love that one. Uh, you're, you're never <laughs> sacrificing. You're always investing in yourself. Uh, be kind to your future self and do good deeds. Uh, the fetus isn't fully developed till after graduate school. Uh, <laughs> doctor, lawyer, or failure. Uh, these are some of her lessons. Um, but the real lesson that I learned from my mom was one in which she didn't ever tell me. She showed me. And the lesson that I have as a parent is that children don't listen to you. They watch you. And I learned about work ethic, about mm -hmm enjoying the consistent every day, persistent without quit pursuit of your own potential, not to wish what other people want for you or what you don't want or what's missing, but really understand what you're voting for in your life, what you want in your life. And that's where those five daily practices came from is watching my mom raise six children with no money, working two jobs, sometimes on food stamps, uh, a second grade teacher, packed our dinner in a paper bag, went into the country Skyer station wagon in Akron, Ohio, filled up turnstiles at convenience stores with greeting cards, uh, just so we could invest in ourselves. And all of my siblings, you know, I'm the low end of the gene pool, I, I always say, because my siblings are extraordinary. They graduated Harvard, Penn, Columbia, summa cum laude, magna cum laude, extremely not only successful people, but kind people. Uh, would give you the shirt off their back. And, you know, my brother, the rabbi, my brother, the doctor, my brother, <coughs> the entrepreneur, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with six degrees and six languages and whatever else they do, uh, those are the testaments of my mom's life. How do you think she did it all? When I look at that, I mean, having a job, right? And then having one kid, two kids, three kids, six kids. How did, when, you're, when you observe her, how did she keep it all together. How did she do it? Well, there's two things in raising the kids that I learned. Uh, pragmatic things. People ask me, one, she woke us all up at 5 a.m. Uh, her God. philosophy was that if she woke us up early enough that we'd stay out of trouble because it was hard enough just to provide uh, and keep educated and motivated and inspired six kids. Uh, but to, to do that, she felt if I woke up at 5 a.m., she didn't have to tell us you know, we couldn't do anything because we didn't have the energy to do it. I mean, there's a couple Friday nights that I thought to myself, gosh, I'd like to stay out till, you know, after midnight. And then I realized that my mom was going to wake me at 5 a.m. regardless. <laughs> you second and, guess and, that decision. Yeah, staying <laughs> yeah so I, that, that was one of uh, the, the secret sauces. And then, mm. you know, the other one, which we were joking about early is my mom was a, a black belt. You know, she may not look like it. She's your typical Jewish mom. If you, you know, look in the dictionary under Jewish mom, there's a picture of mine. Uh, but she was a third degree black belt in uh, the martial art of Jewish guilt. And those were the two things uh, that allowed my mom uh, to be such an amazing parent. Uh, she, because she had leverage and credibility, she could use that uh, weapon of guilt that we just, I, 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 I just couldn't see myself not doing the right thing or being successful or trying my best or learning lessons or having fun because it would kill my mom, right? And in fact, the few fights that I got into with my younger brothers, I remember one time, like a, a typical, you know, 12 year old sitting on my 11 year old's uh, brother's chest doing the, you know, <laughs> suck up the spit thing on his forehead. <laughs> And holding his arms down and he's screaming. And my mom is in the background saying, get off. This is hurting me more than it's hurting him. Please stop. Stop. It's hurting me more than it's hurting him. And I got off. You know, the guilt was overwhelming. So uh, if you want to be a successful parent, I say, wake your kids up early and guilt them. <laughs> the force is strong with Jewish guilt. Yeah, for sure. Um, tell me more about the five daily practices. Well, you know, I re, uh, took stock in who I was in my mid thirties when I lost everything. My wife uh, was trying to straighten me out and she said, Hey, you're going to end up dead. I'm leaving. You don't make me happy because you're not taking stock in who you were and what you wanted to become. So I ended up uh, saving my marriage and 
changing my entire paradigm of life into a world of more than enough by living with gratitude the way I grew up. My mom wouldn't let me come down to the breakfast table without an attitude of gratitude. Forgiveness, to be able to forgive myself, to give me peace. Accountability was big in my home. So ask myself, what did I do to attract this to myself? And what am I supposed to learn? Most people, especially have a law degree, right? They live in liability, blame, shame, and justification. And then understanding motivation and inspiration, which is effectively communicating not just with everyone around you, but effectively communicating with what you're connected to and through. So I used to see mountains as things that I had to get over, under, through, or around. But now when I see a mountain, it represents what I'm connected to and through, meaning that which made the mountain is inside of me. It walks beside me. And the power of that connection uh, changed my life. So I created, once I realized these values, gratitude, forgiveness, accountability, and effective communication, those became my currency of faith, an object of energy that I put into the flow of the universe to get what I wanted. But I also realized I lived in the pragmatic world, you know, the, where the law of Goya applied. One of the laws that my mom uh, absolutely showed me, the, the get off your ass, G-O-Y-A, the law of Goya. And so I wanted to have practices to help me with that law and so one in the first practice was know my what i realized that so many people are lost trying to find purpose and passion and profit they don't realize they already are happy healthy wealthy and worthy what am i doing to interfere with it what do i want personally experientially giving and receiving every day not being afraid of being a hypocrite and learning and growing and changing my mind being able to deal with, you know, you have FOMO and FOJO, right? The fear of missing out, the fear of what other thinks. I, I made a JOMO, the joy of missing out, the joy of what other people think by knowing my what. Once I knew my what, it became easy because now I just need to know my who. Who can I help and who can help me? Then I need to know my how. And that to me is the mathematical equation of luck. My how is dictated by paying attention to and giving intention to what I think, say, do, believe, and even my personality traits, characteristics, obsessions, and addictions, what I call my unconscious competencies, attention plus intention equals the coincidences in my life. These are the hows. I study what I planned, what I don't have planned, activity I get paid for, activity I don't get paid for. There's no work in my life, not with gratitude in my life, the ability to find or seek the light, the love, and the lessons. There's no shortages, voids, or obstacles. There is only activity I get paid for and activity I don't get paid for. And then one of the major hows in my life is I study sleep, so my tomorrow starts today. I start my day at 9 p.m., that doesn't mean I wake up at 9 p.m. I haven't got that crazy, but I have an unwinding routine at 9 mm. p.m. that puts my mind, my body, and my soul into the position of not only recovery, but what I call of clear, balanced, focused existence, meaning my ego's out of the way, my subconscious and unconscious mind is drawing a download while I sleep. So if you know your what, your who, and your how, you next need to know your now. And remember, 100% of the things you do now get done. Most people that don't know what to do, it's because they haven't taken inventory of their what, the who, and the how, and they haven't deciphered what's most important to them to do it. So they sit there paralyzed by the an analytical state that they're in. If you know how to value what you're doing, importance versus urgency. Eisenhower has a great matrix, importance versus urgency. If you know your what, your who, and your how, you'll know what to do now and what to do next. The difference between successful, passionate, purposeful, profitable people is the people that do things and get them done. Then finally, most importantly, I apply my why to my life. See, I don't look for a why. I don't look to love to what, what I do. I learn to love everything I do. I won't do it if I can't learn to love it. It stems from, of course, Viktor Frankl's Man's Search of Meaning. Of but I can find the light, the love, one. and the lessons yeah. in anything. So I have this philosophy or practice of applying my why to whatever activities there are, or whatever people or ideas are around me. I stop, drop, and roll when I find myself for minutes and moments in ego-based consciousness, triggered by the need to be right, offended, separate, inferior, superior, anxious, frustrated, angry, guilty. All of those things take our mind, body, and soul, put them on fire, create void shortages and obstacles, send us off in an accelerated trajectory against what we want, away from what we want, creating more 
voids, creating more obstacles. So that philosophy of stop, drop, and roll when I my mind, my body, and soul's on fire uh, has helped me. So know your what, your who, your how, your now, and apply your why. I promise you, everything you desire will come rapidly and accurately. A lot to unpack there. I'm going to have to re-listen that a couple of times. David, I well, I'll send it to everyone too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll send it. David at dmelter.com. You can have my five daily practices. Very cool. Yeah. Um, check it out. Um, I know you're a big proponent of making sure you have mentors. Okay. So I'd love to hear some of the most, and we talked about your mom. Well, who do you consider maybe now or in the past, some of your um, business mentors? I know Lee Steinberg. I know that you've talked um, that kind of you've given advice to Gary Vee. He's given you advice and probably Warren Moon is a colleague and mentor who I'd love to hear some of the lessons learned from some of the mentors in your life. Yeah. So, you know, first of all, Gary is the most recent mentor. I mentor him on sports agency because they started one. He mentors me on digital marketing. And what I've learned, the biggest lesson from that mentor is you cannot post enough. You cannot fathom the size, scope and scale of an audience. Post, post, post and post more. If your best friends and family aren't telling you hey, you got to slow down, you're posting too much, you haven't even hit the minimum amount that you should be posting. It took me three years to believe Gary. I'm now four and a half years into working with him and I post as much as I can. Uh, Warren Moon, I learned the majesty of calmness. I didn't understand how important it was to be at neutral, at center. And so my philosophy of unwinding, of plateauing and growing and creating a baseline for the day of being at center, I used to actually celebrate uh, too much, not knowing that that creates as much interference as mm. getting down on yourself. And so the majesty of calmness I learned from Warren Moon, uh, Lee Steinberg taught me uh, the abundance and negotiation of articulating value to be greater than that which you're asking for. So with salary caps and arbitrations and collective bargaining agreements, Lee was the master at articulating value greater than what he was asking for. He would be a student and research what was necessary and value. And then my greatest mentor is dead, uh, and his name is Napoleon Hill. And I, I read Think and Grow Rich every day. I'm in the movie, Think and Grow Rich, The Legacy. I am in the new book, Think and Grow Rich, The Legacy. Uh, and I want to create a legacy through the modern day mediums of all the Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, podcasts, TV shows, movies, everything that I'm so blessed to be a part of. My mission of empowering over a billion people to be happy is through what Napoleon Hill has taught me as a mentor. And that's finding the people that sit in the situation that you want to be in and ask them for help. And so my podcast, The Playbook, is based off of Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich. I have interviewed over 800 of the most successful billionaires, millionaires, entrepreneurs, celebrities, athletes, entertainers, everyone from Tony Hawk, as you said, to Cameron Diaz, uh, to Deepak Chopra and Sadhguru, uh, all asking them, hey, can you give me some directions to how you got to where you are and what you're good at? And uh, I suggest anyone uh, that has mentors to have at least three, three at a time, people who sit in the situation that you want to be in and ask them for help. David, I'm the first one to thank you. Where should we point people towards online um, so they can find out more? Where are all the places they should go? Well, you can Google me, David Meltzer, or email me, david at dmeltzer.com. It's that simple, david at dmeltzer.com. I send everyone my ebook, audio book. I'll sign a book, ship it to you, pay for it. David at dmeltzer, my five daily practices. If you need help, I do free trainings for over 20 years, david at dmeltzer.com. Jeremy, I appreciate the opportunity. I know you're one of my 1000s with the Rise 25, empowering others to empower others to be happy. If I can find a thousand Jeremy's in the world, I know they'll empower a thousand to empower a thousand. A thousand times a thousand is a million, a million times a thousand a billion. We can create a collective consciousness of abundance where there'll be more than enough of everything for everyone, where we can make a lot of money, help a lot of people and have a lot of fun together. Jeremy, thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Thanks, David. And check out his website, dmelter.com and the playbook. And have a great day, everyone. Thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.